Yes, hello there and welcome. Now I want us to look at another chemistry revision paper for Form 2. So let's begin with the first question, which is a periodic table, as you can see. So the question is asking, below is a periodic table, the letters do not represent the actual symbols. So if the question is not specific, only use the letters in the questions. So if the question is not specific like that, you can use the letters or you can replace the letters using the actual chemical symbol but if the question was specific only use the letters therefore in that instance you should only use the letters for anything so question letter a is asking give the name of the chemical family represented by letter o so the name of the chemical family represented by letter o that is halogens that is group number seven so the group number seven these uh, elements are called halogens or they are called the salt producers so that's the name of the chemical family or the group whereby O belongs so that is halogen so the next one write a balanced chemical equation when element K reacts with element O so for the for the element K we know that that is sodium for the element O we know that that is iodine so in this case we are going to react iodine gas so if it's a gas we must represent it with a two so remember this iodine this is a substance which undergoes sublimation, whereby sublimation is say that this is the process whereby a solid changes straight to gas. It skips the liquid phase and changes, changes straight to gas. So for the iodine, we see that the gray crystal of iodine, when subjected to heat, they are going to change from gray solid to a purple, a purple vapor of iodine gas. Now that iodine gas is the one which we are going now to react here with element, uh, with element K. So when K reacts with O, which is a gas, we are going to get KO. So why did we get KO? We, get, we got KO because the valency of K is 1, which is positive. The valency of O is also 1, which is negative. So if these two react, they exchange the valencies. And if they exchange the valencies, therefore, the product to be obtained is KO. Now, to balance this equation, we are going to put 2 in front of the K and 2 in front of the product, which is KO, and the equation is balanced. Then again... For the balancing of these chemical equations, we have a separate video which covers the balancing of uh, the chemical equations. So please, I'll ask you to go and check that video in order to know best way and the methods by which you can use in order to balance the chemical equations. So that was the answer, which is KO. And also the other thing that you should check in balancing chemical equations always in, include the state symbols. So whereby here we know that the K is metal, so the state symbol is S. And then uh, the other one, which is O, this is a gas because we have added the two. So this is a gas, so the state symbol is G. And then the product, we get a solid. Because if you expose the metal in a gas, so we still have the metal, which is solid. But the metal will now be engulfed with the gas. So the product you are going to get there is still a solid. So the next question is asking, name the type of bond formed when B reacts. Now that B that you have just talked talked about so name the type of bond formed when k reacts with o so if a metal reacts with a non-metal so the type of bond to be formed here is an ionic bond so an ionic bond is a bond formed when a metal reacts with a non-metal so let's go through this so the first one is the covalent bond so the covalent bond is formed when non-metals react example we have the oxygen molecule so if non-metals react we get a non uh, the covalent bond if a metal and a non-metal react, we get an ionic bond. If metals react, if two metals react, we get a metallic bond. And then coordinate bond is formed when one atom donates two electrons to be shared. Example for this uh, coordinate or dative bond, we have the ammonium molecule and also we have hydroxonium ion. We can also have the ozone. So the ozone, which is O3, it means that one atom has donated two electrons to be shared. Also, this we covered in the previous class. Please, I'll urge us to go and check those previous class, uh, which covers the different types of bonds that we have. So the next question is asking, write a balanced chemical reaction when element L reacts with element I. So in this case, we know that the element L is magnesium and element I is nitrogen. So in short, it's like we are being asked, what is the product form when magnesium reacts with nitrogen? So here we are only going to use the letter. So if element L reacts with element I, so the products to be formed, you are going to get L3, I2. So why did we get L3 and I2? 
So in forming the products, what happens is that we only use the valences of the elements or the compounds to form the product. And the valences interchange. So the valency of this one goes to the other compound. The valency of this one goes to the other compound. So in this case, what happens is that the valency of L is 2. So the atomic number of L, remember, it is 12. So being 12, the configuration is 2, 8, 2. So if the configuration is 2, 8, 2, it will mean that it is losing the two electrons in order to become stable. Therefore, the valency of L becomes positive 2. Positive means losing. So since it's positive 2, it means that it loses two electrons in order to become stable. Now the valency of I in this case, uh, the valency of I is 3 negative. So the atomic number of nitrogen is 7. So nitrogen is atomic number 7. That is letter I is 7. So the configuration is 2, 5. So the configuration being 2, 5, it will mean that this element I requires 3 electrons in order to be stable. So since it needs to gain 3 electrons, therefore, the charge will be negative because negative means gaining electrons. How many electrons must it gain? It must, must gain 3 electrons. Therefore, the charge for this element I will be 3 negative, meaning that it needs to gain 3 electrons in order to become stable. Now the valency for letter L is 2 positive, valency for I is 3 negative. Therefore, in forming the product, it is only the valencies that interchange. And that's why we have the product as L3, that 3 is the valency of I. And then for the I, we have I2, that is the valency for the letter L. And that is the product that you are going to form, L3, I2. So if we substitute L and I with the nitrogen and uh, magnesium and nitrogen, we are going to get magnesium 3 and nitrogen 2. So that is the product that is formed when element L reacts with element I. And also you should not forget to include the state symbols because if you have been asked what is the stoichiometric equation, the word stoichiometric means the equation must have the correct state symbols, chemical symbol and balancing equation. Those three things must be included in a stoichiometric equation. So for this, the state symbol for letter L that is a solid because it's a metal. Why is it a metal? It loses two electrons to be stable. Therefore, it, if it loses electrons, that is a metal. So the state symbol is solid. The state symbol, the state symbol of I, the state symbol is a gas. Because this element I reacts by losing electrons. Since it loses electrons, therefore, it automatically becomes a gas. So the state symbol of I is G. And then the product that you are going to obtain, it's a solid. Because it's like exposing a metal to a gas. If you expose a metal to a gas, it will still remain to be a metal. Just that that metal will be now be coated with the layer of the gas. So that's the state symbol of the product which is solid. So the next question is asking, an isotope has 18 neutrons and a mass number of 34. So the isotope has 18 neutrons and a mass of 34. So question letter A is asking, draw the atomic structure of element Q. So draw the atomic structure of element Q. So how do we get the mass number? Let's first of all look at the formula for obtaining the mass number. So the mass number is obtained uh, when we add the number of protons and the neutrons together. So protons plus neutrons, we get the mass number. So in this case, first of all, we had to do the calculation. So we have to do the calculation first in order to draw the structure. So mass number is equal to the number of protons plus neutrons. So having that in consideration, so we'll substitute. 34 minus 18 is uh, plus the number, or rather, this is what we'll have said. Uh, the 34 is equal to 18 neutrons plus the number of protons, which have not been given. Because we must know the number of protons in order to draw the structure. We cannot use the number of neutrons. We must know the number of protons, because the number of protons is the atomic number. Therefore, to get the number of protons, we'll use that formula under substitution, and we're going to find out that the number of protons is equal to 16. Therefore, we are drawing the structure of 16 electrons. So don't forget, never use the number of neutrons to draw the structure. Always use the number of protons. So here the hint, you have already been given the hint. 34 is the mass number. The number of neutrons is 18. So what is the number of protons? So the number of protons is that... At the 34 mass number minus the number of neutrons, which is 18, so we get the number of protons, which is 16. And that is the structure of the element 16. So this element 16, uh, what's the original name of element 16, the periodic table? So element 16 is sulfur. 
So sulfur is the one which is element 16. So the next question is asking, write its electronic arrangement. So the electronic arrangement is 286. So not this. If you could have gotten the first one wrong, uh, which was letter A, Roman 1. If you could have gotten that Roman 1 to be wrong, you, you drew 18. So you could have gotten also the second one uh, wrong. Because you see, you should always draw the structure you should always name the configuration based on the number of protons and the atomic number, not the number of neutrons. So that's why we began by saying we have the mass number, we have the number of neutrons. What is the atomic number? So we had to get the atomic number in order to continue. So the atomic number is 16, and then here it's asking the configuration. So the configuration will be 286. That is the configuration for our element, uh, the element Q. So the third question, which is tied to both of the questions, is asking, explain to which group and period Q belongs. So group and period that Q belongs. If you look at the configuration, so the configuration, we have 286. If you add all of them, we get 16, which is the atomic number. So the configuration is 286. So since the configuration is 286, from here, we can be able to get the number of uh, the group number and the number of periods that this element belongs. So, how many energy levels does it have? We see that it has three energy levels. The first energy level has two. The second energy level has eight. The third energy level has six. So, since it has three energy levels, it means that it is in period three because of three energy levels. And then the last value is six. Two, eight, six. The last value is six. Since the, the last value is six, therefore, this last value always tells us the group it belongs so since the last value is 6, it will tell us that this is in group number 6. So that's how you can be able to identify the group and period to which an element belongs based on the configuration. So it's in period 3 and it is in group number 6. Uh, group, num uh, group number 6. So the next question is asking about the liquid nitrogen and the separation techniques. So it's asking, nitrogen and oxygen are among the gases in air. Nitrogen boils at negative 196 degrees Celsius and oxygen boils at negative 183 degrees Celsius. Explain how pure nitrogen can be obtained from a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. So this is simple, through fractional distillation of liquid air. If you can be able to remember the reaction scheme of fractional distillation of liquid air, it's whereby air enters the filter and in the filter there's the removal of dust particles because in air we see that we have different components of air. So air is made up of different components, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, inert gases, dust, and water vapor. So all these substances are able to, to be separated in the separation techniques of liquid air, whereby air first of all enters the filter, and in the filter we remove the dust. So the dust is the first one to be removed. So the rest of the air is pumped into the intake chamber, whereby the intake chamber is just a pump which pushes the air through the through the whole column of the separation technique. So from there, the air enters into the cooling chamber whereby water vapor is removed. The air enters into the compressor whereby the liquid air is made, uh, the air is made into a liquid, etc. So there's a chamber whereby air enters a chamber full of conch sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. Now in this chamber, carbon dioxide is removed. So the air that is passing through now is having only nitrogen, oxygen and inert gas. So this air enters the compressor chamber whereby it is compressed under 200 atmospheres at negative 200 degrees Celsius. So the product formed here will be liquid air. So it will be air but in liquid form. So this air in liquid form enters the fractionating chamber whereby now these three gases are separated in order. So in the fractionating chamber, nitrogen gas distills off first at negative 196 degrees Celsius followed by argon or inert gas which distills off at negative 186 degrees Celsius followed by oxygen which distills off uh, the last at negative 183 degrees Celsius. So here the answer was fractional distillation of liquid air whereby the oxygen will distill, uh, the nitrogen rather is going to distill at negative 196 degrees Celsius and oxygen will distill off the second at negative 183 degrees Celsius. So you are basing your answer based on fractional distillation of the air. So the next question is asking about chromatography. 
and it's saying the spot below represents a paper chromatogram for three brands of soda suspected to contain unwanted food additives. The results showed the presence of food substance N and P only. So the result only showed the presence of food substance N and P only. So the chromatogram circled the spots of unwanted food substance. Obvious. The spots that look like being outliers. So here, the spots that are, are outliers, we have that spot on N and that spot on P. So these two spots are the outliers. So since they are the outliers, they have not followed the formation or the pattern by which every spot is following. So it will mean that those are the unwanted food additives. The next question, label the solvent front and the baseline. So here we have that's the solvent front and the baseline. But why is this line called the solvent front? Why is it called the solvent front? Why is the baseline called the baseline? So the baseline is referred to as the baseline because this is where the pigments are placed on the chromatogram. So the, the region where the pigments are placed on the chromatogram is always referred to as the base line. Let's look at the solvent front. Why is the solvent front referred to as the solvent front? So it's called the solvent front because this is the farthest point by which the separated pigments can reach. And that's the definition. Definition of the solvent front, this is the farthest point by which a solvent, uh, the solvent under separation can reach on a chromatogram. So that's the definition of the solvent front. The baseline, this is the region whereby the pigments are placed on the chromatogram. And that is right. So let's go to the next question. It's asking, state two differences between luminous and the non-luminous flame. So in a previous class, we had discussed this in depth, but anyway, let's just go through them also here. So stage two differences between the luminous and the non-luminous flame. So first of all, we are going to look at the color. So the luminous flame is blue in color, while the non-luminous flame, uh, so the luminous flame rather is yellow in color, while the non-luminous flame is blue in color. So that's the first difference. So the other difference, let's look at the size. The luminous flame is large and wavy, while the non-luminous flame is short and steady. So it's very short and steady. So looking at the regions, you see that the luminous flame has four regions, while the non-luminous flame has three regions. The other difference is about the air hole. So you see that the luminous flame is produced when the air hole is closed. So if the air hole is closed, there is no air entering the chimney, so the luminous flame will be produced. While the non-luminous flame is produced when the air hole is fully open. So if the air hole is fully open, the oxygen gas is going to enter into the chimney and then it will form complete combustion of the laboratory gas producing a blue flame. So the other factor is about the sound whereby the luminous, the luminous flame is very burns silently. Luminous flame burns silently. While the non-luminous flame burns noisily or with a roaring sound. So about the sound, the luminous burns silently because you cannot hear the sound of a candle burning. But you can hear the sound of a gas cooker as it is burning. So we have those two. Then the other one is about the light. The luminous flame, it is used for producing light, while the non-luminous flame is used for producing heat. So the luminous flame is used for lighting, while the non-luminous flame is used for heating. So those two functions are important. So about the suit, we see that luminous flame produces suit when burning, while non-luminous flame does not produce suit when burning. So you have those differences, among others, for the luminous and the non-luminous flame. So the next question is asking, how many atoms are there in the following compounds? So how many atoms are there in the following compounds? So if you can be able to rephrase this question, you can rephrase it as, how many elements are present in the following compounds? Because if we go to form 3, form 4, if you have been asked how many atoms, you are going to calculate it using a different methods, using the Avogadro's constant, which is 6.023 times 10 raised to power 23 atoms. That's what you are going to use. But in this case, we can rephrase the question as, how many elements are present in the following compounds? So how many elements? So the first element is, uh, the first compound is lithium chloride. So as you can see, the chemical symbol of lithium chloride, we have LiCl. So how many elements are those? We only have two elements, which is lithium and chlorine. So the answer there was two. You, you just say two, and then you're correct. 
So the next one is zinc chloride. So zinc chloride, that's the chemical symbol of zinc chloride, ZnCl2. So the valency of zinc is 2, the valency of chlorine is 1. So since the valency of chlorine is 1, we don't write 1 below the zinc. But for the zinc which is 2, we write 2 below the chlorine. So how many elements are here in zinc chloride? So we have three elements. We have one zinc and we have two chlorine. So we have three elements present. Then the last one is calcium carbonate. So this calcium carbonate, how many elements are present? If you can see, we have CaCO3. So here we have five elements. So the first element is calcium. The second element is carbon. The third, fourth, fifth element is oxygen. We have three oxygen elements and then we have one calcium and then we have one carbon so if you add all all of them we have five elements present so here it's very simple if you can be able to know how to write the chemical the chemical uh, the chemical molecule or the chemical symbols on that compound therefore it will be very easy for you to know exactly how many are there because we are based our answers based on the chemical compounds that we have like for example, the one, the, the first one is lithium chloride, Li and Cl. We can see there are only two. The calcium carbonate, we have five because we have one calcium, we have one carbon, and then we have three oxygen. So those are five in total. So the next question is about balancing of chemical equations. And then the first question is balancing between magnesium and hydrochloric acid. So when magnesium reacts with hydrochloric acid, you are going to get magnesium chloride, which is the salt plus hydrogen gas. So remember, if a metal reacts with an acid, we get salt plus hydrogen gas. If, a, uh, if an acid reacts with a base, we get salt plus water. Yeah, salt plus water. If an acid reacts with a metal carbonate or a carbonate, we get salt plus water but since it's a carbonate we also get carbon for oxide now in this case we have magnesium reacting with the dochloric acid that is an acid reacting with the metal so you get a salt which is magnesium chloride plus hydrogen gas so in balancing this equation we put two in front of hydrochloric acid and the equation is balanced so the next equation is asking sodium reacting with water so if sodium reacts with water we are going to get sodium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas so here we are reacting a metal plus water, so we get a hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. So in balancing the equation, we put two in front of sodium, two in front of water, and then also two in front of sodium hydroxide, and the equation will be balanced. So lastly, we have, uh, we have nitric acid reacting with copper carbonate. So since this is a carbonate reacting with an acid, we must get carbon dioxide. So this carbonate, it's like a base, it is reacting like a base. So if it's reacting like a base, an acid plus a base is salt plus water. But since it's a carbonate, we must get carbon dioxide. So here are the products that we are going to get. We're going to get copper nitrate plus carbon dioxide plus water molecules. So here in balancing the equation, you put two in front of nitric acid and then the equation is balanced. Now, in the previous class, we have covered balancing of chemical equations in depth and we went through at least two methods of balancing chemical equations. So, I will urge us, please, if you still don't know how to correctly balance the chemical equation, you can visit the video of balancing chemical equations so that you get to know the best ways and the easiest ways of balancing chemical equations. And also, if you can be able to look at these three equations, so these three equations follow the stoichiometric uh, formation of balancing and forming chemical equation. What is a stoichiometric equation? So if you have been asked to define a stoichiometric equation, you'll say that a stoichiometric equation, this is an equation which has the correct balancing of the equation, it has the correct chemical symbol, and it also has the correct state symbol. So if you can see, all our equations have everything that the stoichiometric equation will, will require. They have the correct balancing, the correct chemical symbol, and also you can see all of them have the correct state symbols. So that is a stoichiometric chemical equation. So the next equation is asking, the valencies of X and Y are one and two respectively. So we have been given the valency of X is one, the valency of Y is two. Then the question is asking, what is the formula of each of their letter A, hydroxide? So we have been given the valency. What is the formula of the hydroxide? 
So we know that the valency of X is 1. The valency of hydroxide is also 1. Therefore, the product that X will form with hydroxide is XOH. Because the valency of X is 1, the valency of hydroxide is 1. So if they exchange their valencies, the product that you are going to get is X1OH1. But in chemistry, we don't write values. Uh, uh, we don't write one values. We write values from two. Therefore, it will mean that the product which will be formed when X reacts with the hydroxide is XOH. So we only exchange the valences to get the product. So the next one is Y. Y reacting with the hydroxide. Y reacting with the OH. So you know that the valency of hydroxide is 1. The valency of Y in this case, you are being given Y is 2. So in forming the product, the Y will come with, uh, with its valency, which is 2. OH will come with, with its valency, which is obvious. It's 1. So if they exchange the valencies, you are going to get Y, then bracket OH2. So that is the valen that's the product formed when Y reacts with OH. Why is it that OH is in bracket? So the reason why we put OH in bracket is because OH is a radical. What is a radical? What did you define radical as in Form 2, the first topic? So we define a radical as these are elements which react as a unit. So they must react as a unit as OH. If you remove the hydrogen from the radical, it ceases to be a radical. If you remove the hydrogen from the oxygen from the radical, it ceases to be the radical. So radical, these are elements reacting as a unit. Whereby we have the hydroxide, we have the nitrite, we have the sulfate, we have the sulfate. We have very many radicals. So in this case, OH is a radical. Since it reacts as a unit, so the whole radical OH is the one which has the charge of negative, the valency of 1. So if Y having a valency of 2 reacts with the OH which has a valency of 1, so they interchange the valency. So the reason why the OH is in bracket is that this thing is a radical. So it behaves like one. The O and the H together, they behave as one substance. So the reason why you put it in bracket is to mean that this radical, all of it is the one which has the charge or the number two, the subscript two below it. So the next one is sulfate. So what happens when X and Y reacts with the sulfate? So remember the valency of X we have been given is 1. But the valency of sulfate, we know that this radical sulfate, the valency is always 2 negative. So if X reacts with the sulfate, so the product we are going to get is X2, uh, whereby this 2 is the valency of the sulfate. So they interchange. So the valency of the sulfate goes below the oxygen. The valency of uh, goes below the X, rather. The valency of the X, which is 1, goes below the sulfate. So the product here to obtain is X2SO4. So, and, and the next one is Y. So what happens when Y now reacts with the sulfate? Remember the valency of Y is 2. The valency of sulfate is 2. So they are going to interchange the valency. The valency of the Y is going to go below the sulfate, which is uh, which is SO4, then 2, the valency of the sulfate will go below the Y, which is 2. So since these are common values, they are all even numbers. So we make the chemical product to be the simplest number or the simplest formula possible. Therefore, since this is 2 and this one is 2, so the two will cancel each other so as to obtain the simplest formula possible, which is YSO. So it is why SO4, because we have made the chemical compound to have the simplest number possible. So the next one is carbonate, and the valency of the carbonate is always 2 negative. So for the X, again, the valencies will interchange. The valency of X will go below the carbonate. The valency of carbonate will go below the X. So the product to form here will be X2CO3. And then for, for Y, since the valency of Y is 2, the valency of carbonate is 2, therefore they are going to interchange the valencies again. If they interchange the valencies, remember the product must be the simplest number possible. So the valencies will cancel each other out and then you are going to obtain YCO3. Then the next one is hydrogen carbonate. So the valency of hydrogen carbonate is always 1. Remember, hydrogen carbonate is also a radical. So a radical means that it reacts as a unit. So since it reacts as a unit, you can't remove either hydrogen carbonate or oxygen. So it must be like that. So this radical, the valency of this radical is 1. So exactly what happens when X, which has 1 valency, reacts with the hydrogen carbonate? So the product to be formed, it will be X 
hydrogen, carbonate. So since all of them have valency of 1, 1, so we don't write that one below them. So it is X, hydrogen, carbonate. Yes, as you can see. So the next one is Y reacting with hydrogen, carbonate. Remember the valency of Y is 2. The valency of hydrogen, carbonate is 1. So since the hydrogen, carbonate is a radical, it reacts as a unit. So the product to be formed will be Y with one valency of the hydrogen carbonate, which we don't write, and then brackets, and then hydrogen carbonate, then below it is two. So that two represents the, radic the valency for Y. So since the valency of Y is two, that's why we put into bracket the whole radical, and then meaning that this whole radical is under this valency of two, which is from Y. Then lastly, we have the nitrates whereby nitrates have a valency of negative. They have a valency of 1. So for the X, we see that the valency of X is 1, the valency of Y, uh, the valency of nitrate is 1. So forming the product of the nitrate when X reacts, it will be XNO3. So that is that. And then what happens when Y reacts with the nitrate? So if Y reacts with the nitrate, it will be, remember the valency of Y is 2, the valency of nitrate is 1. So what happens is that we'll have Y having the one valency for the nitrate which you don't write and then into brackets that radical which is nitrate and saying that everything in in the bracket has captured the valency of two which is from the y so that is what happened so this question was really focused on the valency and it only and it also focused on the radical so if you knew the valencies for the radicals and if you knew the valencies for the y and x which have been given, therefore it will be very easy for you to get this as how we have done it. So the next question is about the atomic number and somewhat the periodic table. So this question is asking, write the atomic number electronic configuration of element Z. So write the atomic number and the electronic configuration of element Z. So the only hint we have been given here, the only hint is that we have been given the structure. So if you can see the structure from the structure, you can be able to know if this is a metal or a non-metal. From the structure again, you can be able to write the electronic configuration because the first energy level has two electrons, so we write two down. The second energy level has eight electrons, so we write eight down. The third energy level has, has only one electron. Yeah, so it only has one electron. So the configuration is two for the innermost, uh, the innermost orbital. And then from two, we have eight from the middle electronic, uh, the energy, so the middle orbital or the energy level, and then we have the last one, which is one. So the configuration is two, eight, one from the diagram. So from this, you can be able to know the group number, the number of period that this element belongs. And you can also be able to identify which element is this in the periodic table. So just by counting, so these are 11. So 11 is sodium. So element Z rep is represent. So this element Z in short is sodium metal. So the question is asking, write the atomic number of and electronic configuration. So the atomic number is 11. 2 plus 8 plus 1 is 11. So that is the atomic number. Electronic configuration is 281. So you obtain the configuration just by checking the diagram. The first energy level has two electrons. The second energy level has eight, so you write two eight. Then the last energy level has one. So that is the electronic configuration. So since it has three energy levels, it will mean that it is in period number three, since it has three energy levels. The last number is always the group number. Since the last number is one, it tells us that this, this element is in group number one. And that is that. So let's look at the next number. It's asking, state four physical properties of halogen group. So state four physical properties. Because we have chemical properties, don't confuse. Physical properties, these are what you can see. What, uh, like for example, if this gas is here, what can I see about this gas? What can I see about this element? So physical properties, these are just what the observable characteristics. So what, write four physical properties of halogen of the halogen group. So first of all, we look, uh, we see that these are non-metal. So they are all non-metal. So they don't conduct electricity. That's the first physical property. They are all non-metals. So the second one is about the atomic radius. So the atomic radius increases down the group. So whereby fluorine, uh, for example, if you compare fluorine and, uh, and iodine, we see that fluorine is smaller while iodine is larger. So the atomic radius increases down the group. So the next one is about the electric, 
uh, the electric conductivity whereby they are all poor conductors of electricity because they are not metals or because they don't lose electrons to be stable they gain so since they are poor conduct since they are not they are not metals it will mean that they are poor conductors of electricity and also the other fact is that they are poor conductors of heat because they are no they are not metals but they are non metals so the other one is that they are both soluble in polar and non-polar solvents so this means that they are soluble in liquids so in solvents like maybe for example water and also in liquids for example the oils etc they can be able to dissolve so the other one is about the colors whereby fluorine is a pale yellow gas chlorine is a pale green gas or you can say it's a yellow green gas fluorine while bromine is a brown liquid bromine is a brown liquid while iodine is a gray solid so they are all colored all of them they are colored differently from the next one so the other one is about the atomic mass whereby the atomic mass increases down the group as the size of the of the atom increases so as the size of the atom increases the atomic mass increases and also you can say as there's the increase in the number of electrons down the group therefore also the size of the atom of the halogen increases so the next question is about relative atomic mass and it's asking determine the relative atomic mass of the following compounds first of all let's define what is relative atomic mass so the relative atomic mass this is simply the mass of any atom compared to 1 over 12 or carbon negative 12 so this is the mass of any atom compared to 1 over 12 that one of the carbon atom so that is the relative atomic mass the mass of any atom compared to 1 over 12 that of carbon atom so as you can see we have to calculate the relative atomic mass of neon having a mass number of 20 with abundance of 90.92 neon the second one having a mass number of 21 with abundance of 0 0.26 and neon having a mass number of 22 with abundance of 8.82 percent so to calculate the relative atomic mass so you take the mass number multiplied by the abundance divided by 100 and then plus the next mass number now plus the next mass number which is 21 times the abundance which is 0.26 percent divided by 100 and then since there are three so you add another one plus 22 which is the mass number times the abundance which is 8.82 percent divided by 100 so if you can be able to calculate this correctly you should get that the ma uh, the abundance of the relative atomic mass is 20.0934 that is that is the abundance or that is the relative atomic mass that you should get from this uh, from this calculation so this mainly comes to two or three marks depending on the examiner or the examiners asked so it's that simple so the next uh, the next one under relative atomic mass is saying that we have argon having a mass number of 36 and atomic number of 18 with an abundance of 0 0.34 percent so for the relative atomic mass you'll notice that the atomic number is exactly the same or the number of protons is exactly the same what is only changing is the mass number or the number of neutrons so it's only the mass number that is changing but the atomic number is exactly the same so in calculating the relative atomic number relative atomic number of argon so you're going to take the mass number which is 36 multiplied by the abundance which is 0 0.36 divided by 100 plus 38 times 0 0.06 divided by 100 and then plus 40 times 99.6 which is the abundance divided by 100 and then you add everything after multiplication so you are going to get 39.9852 which is now the abundance for the second one which is for the argon so that is the relative atomic mass so for the relative atomic mass again remember the mass number is only the one which is changing or the number of neutrons that is the only one which is changing the atomic number remains constant because the atomic number is constant but the mass number is the only one which is changing so that is how simple it is to calculate the relative atomic mass so the next number is asking explain any three chemical properties of alkali metal now this one is asking about the chemical properties so remember for the halogens it was asking about the physical properties what we can see 
if any time you'll be asked in an exam about the chemical properties you should include reactions if there are possible reaction again if you have been asked about the chemical property if there are possible reaction include the reactions in your answering because that is what the chemical property is asking so explain any three chemical property of alkali metal so first of all let's look at reaction in water so if an alkali metal reacts with water we form a metal hydroxide plus hydrogen gas so that is the first and the simplest they if an alkali metal is dissolved in water you form a metal hydroxide plus hydrogen gas example we have sodium if sodium reacts with water you get sodium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas so also the reaction the other chemical property can say the alkali metal reaction with water increases down the group whereby lithium is the least reactive while potassium and rubidium and cesium they are explosive so reaction between alkali metals and water increases down the group so the other one is reaction with acids uh, whereby we see that reaction with alkali metal with acid increases down the group whereby lithium is the least reactive while rubidium cesium potassium those are the most reactive so the alkali metals react with acid to give a salt and hydrogen gas example we have sodium plus hydrochloric acid we get a salt which is sodium chloride plus hydrogen gas so the next one is reaction with halogens so the alkali metals react with halogens e.g chlorine to form um, an alkyl halide so for example we have sodium reacting with chlorine we get sodium chloride which is an alkyl uh, halide if we react potassium plus maybe for example fluorine you get potassium fluoride which is also an alkyl halide so if they react with halogens they form a salt now these are the salts which are called which we are calling now the alkyl halides so the next one is uh, they are oxides so the hydroxides rather so the alkyl or the alkali hydroxides are always basic in nature whereby they turn the red litmus paper to blue in color so and also you can see that sodium and potassium they are strong reducing agents because these are found very high in the reactivity series so they reduce metals below them in the reactivity series for example if sodium reacts with copper 2 oxide the sodium is going to reduce the copper 2 oxide to copper and then the copper 2 oxide will oxidize the sodium to a sodium oxide so this is all about the reduction properties whereby the alkali metals are high have high reducing properties example we have the sodium and the potassium which are found very high in the reactivity series so the next question is asking explain why aluminium conducts electricity by but argon does not this is simple it's because the aluminium contains delocalized electrons or free electrons or mobile electrons while argon is stable it doesn't contain any free or mobile electrons so that was the answer so the aluminium is a metal and it contains mobile free or delocalized electrons while the argon atom does not contain free or mobile electrons so the next question was asking differentiate between octet and duplet so uh, for the octet we'll say that this is the phenomenon whereby an atom has fully filled eight electrons in the outermost energy level so if the outermost energy level is fully filled with eight electrons that phenomenon is called octet while if the outermost energy level is filled with two electrons especially it happens in helium if the outermost energy level of helium is filled with two electrons that phenomenon is called now the duplet so remember octet the outermost energy level is fully filled with eight electrons duplet the outermost energy level is filled with two electrons that is especially for helium so the next question was asking differentiate between electron affinity and ionization energy so for the electron affinity this is the energy released or the energy given off when an atom gains an electron so it's the energy given off when an atom gains an electron while ionization energy this is the minimum energy that is absorbed or the minimum energy that is yeah the minimum energy absorbed when an atom or an element loses electron so if it loses electron so the temperatures will go down and then what is going to happen is that this form of energy will now be referred to as the ionization energy so it's the minimum energy 
that is required for an atom to lose electrons in its gaseous state. While electron affinity, this is the minimum energy given off when an, when an element or an atom gains an electron in its gaseous state in order to become stable. So that is that simple. So question next is asking, below is a diagram to illustrate the laboratory preparation of oxygen gas. As you can see, so take note of the gas preparation, uh, gas collection method. Take note of what is being, uh, like what is in the dropping funnel and what is in the round bottom flask. So in the round bottom flask is labeled A. While in the funnel, in the dropping funnel, we have hydrogen peroxide. And then the gas collection, we are collecting oxygen gas. So if you are collecting oxygen gas, we have hydrogen peroxide in the dropping funnel. Automatically, what is letter A? Letter A is a catalyst. What is that catalyst? So that catalyst is manganese. It's manganese for oxide. But what is a catalyst? A catalyst is any substance that speeds up the rate of chemical reaction. So any substance speeding up the rate of chemical reaction is referred to as a catalyst. So let's go to the first question. Name a suitable catalyst labeled A. So the suitable catalyst is manganese for oxide. So this manganese for oxide speeds up the rate at which hydrogen peroxide is going to break in order to release oxygen. So question B is asking, name the gas collection method used in this experiment. So the gas collection method used in this experiment, this is over water method. So this is over water because the gas is collected over water. So remember we have three gas collection methods as you can see. We have three gas collection methods here by the first one is the downward delivery. So this downward delivery is mostly used if we are collecting dense gases. So if the gas is dense, we use the downward delivery. Example, we have chlorine gas, carbon dioxide gas. So if we are dealing with the dense gases, we collect them using the downward delivery. Now this downward delivery can also be called upward displacement of air. You can call it the downward delivery method or the upward displacement of air method. So the next one, we have the upward delivery whereby we collect a lighter gas uh, on top of the apparatus. So this method can be called the upward delivery or it can be called the downward displacement of air. So take note not to confuse. So this is the downward displacement of air. And then lastly, we now have the overwater method as the last gas collection method. So we have three gas collection methods, the downward delivery, the upward delivery, and the overwater method. So why you should you use overwater method? You should use overwater method if the gas is lighter than air or if the gas is less denser than air and also if the gas is less soluble in water. So you can use that method. So the next question is asking, uh, the second last question that is, is asking, the curves below represent variation in temperature with time when pure and impure solid substances are heated. As you can see that graph. So we have two graphs, which is letter A and letter B. So this gas is basically as asking about the purity of substances. So the first one, which curves show variation of a pure solid? So the curve that shows the variation of pure solid here, we have curve labeled B. So the curve label B is of a pure solid. Why is it of a pure solid? It's because the answer to give is that it has sharp melting and boiling point. So for example, for the curve B, you can see that the inclined lines, the inclined line are exactly inclining, but the change of state is exactly horizontal. So since it's exactly horizontal, that is what we are calling, it has a sharp melting and boiling point. So the change of state is not inclined. The change of state is exactly horizontal. After the change of state, we again absorb heat and then the next change of state is exactly horizontal. So if you see this in an exam, know that that is always the pure substance. If, the, if it has sharp melting and boiling point, that is a pure substance. So for the substance A, we see that it is not pure substance because yes, it has inclined substance with the horizontal, the first part, but now the last part we see that the change of state, the change of state, instead of being horizontal, the change of state is inclined. So since the change of state is inclined, we automatically know that that is not a pure substance. That is an impure substance. So which curve shows variation of a pure solid? So pure solid was letter B because it has sharp melting and a boiling point. So the next one, state the effect of impurity on melting and boiling point of substance. So 
the effect of impurities that impurities they lower the melting point and they raise the boiling point so for example if you are looking at water pure water boils at uh, pure water melts at 0 degrees celsius and then it boils at 100 degrees celsius so for example if we add sodium chloride or if we, or if we add an impurity to the water it will mean that this water for example uh, like will now melt at negative 5 degrees celsius and then it will boil at 120 degrees celsius so you see if you add an impurity to any substance so the impurity will lower the melting point and will raise the boiling point so th that is the effect of an impurity on a substance so the last question is asking below is the ph scale as you can see that is the ph scale that we have which ranges from 0 to 14. remember 7 is neutral from 0 to 6 these are acids from 8 to 14 these are bases so the first question is asking define the term indicator so what is an indicator so these are substances that show the acidity or basicity of a substance so those are indicators they help us identify between acid and a base and neutral substances basically that's an indicator it gives us an indication that this is an acid this is a base this is neutral so that is an indicator so the next one the next question which value represents sodium hydroxide solution so the sodium hydroxide solution this remember sodium hydroxide this is a very strong base so since it's a very strong base so the strong bases here in the ph scale they range from 11 to 14 but sodium ranges from 13 to 14 so if you could give your answer as 13 reading 13 and four, or 14 you could have gotten your answer correct so which value represents sodium hydroxide solution it's either 13 or 14 which represents a very strong basic solution whereby yes, sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide these are very strong basic solution so the next question is asking name any solution having a value of seven so value of seven this is neutral so the question is asking name any solution that is neutral so any solution that is neutral first of all uh, the first one which is very simple is water water is always neutral apart from water we have sodium chloride which is salt so sodium chloride solution don't say solid be specific say sodium chloride solution so sodium chloride solution is also neutral also we have sugar solution apart from sugar solution we have cooking oil apart from cooking oil we also have the blood the blood is also neutral so the blood of a person the blood basically blood blood is also neutral so the last question is asking name any other indicator used in the laboratory apart from the ph scale that we can see so name any other indicator so we have methyl blue we have methyl orange we have methyl red we have phenolphthalein indicator we have eosin and the only natural indicator we have is the plant or the flower extract so we have all those which are artificial but the only natural indicator we have in the laboratory is flower extract so whereby you take a pestle and a mortar you take different flowers and you crush them now this this solution formed by the flower you can easily use it to determine if this is an acid or this is a base if you have been given a solution so the flower extract is only the natural indicator that we have in the laboratory uh, also we have the litmus paper not to forget so the next question is asking the last question define a neutralization reaction so a neutralization reaction this is any reaction that involves the reaction between an acid and a base so any reaction involving an acid and a base is referred to as a neutralization reaction so don't forget maybe for example if hydrochloric acid reacts with sodium hydroxide that is a neutralization reaction because you are reacting an acid and a base.